The history of science is a domain that deals with how the scientific advancements evolved over a period of time in any given branch of science. And unfortunately, this domain, the history of science, is not so very popular in the public discourse. And in that context, we are trying to explore the hidden pages of the history of science related to Kerala and calculus. Both Kerala and calculus independently are pretty familiar with all of us, but combinedly, Kerala and calculus, what is its history? Here is the story, a story that every student of Bharat should be learning about. Let's get started. Let us cut this documentary into three chapters. The first one is the key aspects in the history of Kerala, which are contextual and relevant for our current topic. And the second chapter is Kerala's contributions in the field of calculus and astronomy. The most important chapter, what are those contributions that came out of Kerala? with respect to calculus, but not known to the public. And the third chapter is something about what you are probably thinking now. Calculus was invented in Europe. What role did India have to play in that? That is exactly what we're going to see. How did the calculus possibly got transmitted out of India, eventually to Europe? And just in case you don't know what is calculus, please bear with me for a minute. We'll try to explain. Let's get started. That's the first chapter, the key aspects in the history of Kerala. According to Bhagavata Puranam and many other ancient Indian scriptures, it was sage Parashurama who started the civilization here in Kerala thousands of years ago. And Kerala as a civilization has been very special in many facets. For instance, Kalari Payattu, it's one of the oldest martial arts known in the world and is indigenous to Kerala and is still being practiced today. And Parashurama is the founder of Kalari Payattu. Also, the Brahmanical and the ritualistic aspects of the culture of Kerala were established in a very different manner by Parashurama. The Vedic culture and heritage of Kerala is very different from the rest of parts of Bharat and is very interesting. We will see more about this as we proceed. And also we all know that how popular is Kerala's Ayurvedic culture and heritage. All in all, Kerala is very well known in ancient Indian scriptures as Parashurama Kshetram, which means the land of Parashurama. And Kerala has centuries old rich heritage in many fields like Kalari Payattu, Ayurveda, Vedanga Jyotisha and a lot more. That's the first point about the history of Kerala. And moving on to the second point, Kerala played an incredibly important role in commerce in the ancient world. We learned in school that Vasco da Gama discovered sea route to India. Well, that's one of the dumbest things that I learned as a child. He documented his first voyage experiences in a journal, what you're seeing on the screen right now, where he plots the entire sea route, how he traveled all the way from Lisbon in Portugal to Calicut in India. And he clearly writes that with the help of a pilot that an African king provided to Vasco da Gama, he could reach India. He himself never wrote that he discovered Siru to India. Anyways, that's the reason I said it's the dumbest thing that we have learned in our school, that Vasco da Gama discovered Siru to India. Anyways, the point here is he lands in Calicut or what we know today is Kozikod. It's a shore city on Kerala. What's important for us is in this journal, Vasco da Gama writes that during those times, the trade routes via sea between Africa and India were well established and he could manage to reach India through that well established trade route. And at those times, Kerala was one of the most important hubs for this trade route by sea. And the role of Kerala as a trade hub is not just from the times of Vasco da Gama, but it dates back thousands of years even before that. So for instance, the Roman traveler Pliny or the Greek traveler Ptolemy of the times of 100 CE, we are talking almost 2000 years ago, even in their writings, Kerala was mentioned as one of the important trade hubs in the East. And if we explore the well-chronicled spice route and the silk route, there we will be able to clearly see that Kerala has been a hub in the East on the spice route and is very well connected to West Asia, Africa and Europe. And this is very interesting. Tabula Putingeriana. It is a 2000 years old map of the whole world showing the road networks and the sea routes created by the Romans during their times. This was documented almost in 79 AD, almost like 2000 years ago from now. And this map towards the rightmost, that's towards the east, there is a place called Musiris. We don't know with what name it is called today, but it happens to be a place on the Malabar coast, which essentially is a very important trade hub. That shows how important was Malabar coast in the ancient times and by extension Kerala. Now moving on to the point number three, another most important aspect in the history of Kerala. Lord Jesus Christ had 12 disciples or apostles, 12 students during his times. And almost all these 12 apostles lived by Lord Jesus Christ throughout his life. And one of these 12, Saint Thomas, whom we can see in the Last Supper, all the 12 disciples, 
painted by Leonardo da Vinci. So it is believed that St. Thomas arrived in Kerala or on the Malabar coast almost 1800 to 2000 years ago to spread the Gospels. So the point for us here is the Malabar coast and especially Kerala has centuries old rich culture and heritage of Christianity. And by extension, the fourth and last point about Kerala's history is because of the centuries old rich culture and heritage of the Syrian Christians that have been residing in Kerala and due to the trade links from Kerala towards the West Asia, Kerala also acted as a portal for knowledge transfer from India towards the world. Severus Sibho, a Syrian scholar and a bishop of the Syrian Orthodox Church, he was the first one to introduce the Hindu numeral system to the West Asia, which eventually got propagated towards Europe and the whole world what is using today, the Hindu numeral system. And the transmission of the Hindu numeral system by Severus Sibok towards Syria is through the trade links that the Malabar coast had with the West Asia. So the point for us here is the Malabar coast acted as a portal for knowledge transfer in the ancient times. So if we zoom out and see, the main point here for us is Kerala has thousands of years of ancient Vedic culture, rich heritage, hub for trade and commerce in the ancient world and has been a multi-religious and multicultural place and most importantly, it also acted as a portal for knowledge transfer due to the heavy trade transactions that happened via this coast. There could be a lot of other historical aspects about Kerala but we just picked up the ones which are relevant for us to understand the evolution of calculus and transmission of calculus as a branch of knowledge from Bharat. So in that context, these four aspects are very important for us to understand. So let's move on. So that's the end of the first chapter, the key aspects in the history of Kerala and we move on to the second one, Kerala's contributions in the fields of calculus and astronomy the most important chapter of all three. So what is calculus? In high school mathematics, we learned about geometry. It's all about shapes and their properties like areas, volumes, lengths, etc. We also learned about algebra, another branch of mathematics, which deals with proportions and relationships between two quantities. It's all about equalities and inequalities. And also we might have learned about another branch of mathematics, which is probability. It's all about chance. What is the chance of the occurrence of a specific event in given conditions? That is probability. Now, if you observe geometry, algebra, and probability, for that matter, any branch of mathematics has a very well-defined purpose. And that very purpose of that field of mathematics drives its applications in real life. Same way, another branch of mathematics that deals with calculating the rate of change of any given aspect or entity or an event, that is called as calculus. Let's take a closer look. Say if a cricket batsman hit a ball, now that's the path of the ball right from the moment it hits the bat up until it hits the ground. Now if we deal with certain questions like what is the velocity of the ball at its peak height? or what is the area swept by the ball in total or when will the ball hit the ground in time so to answer these kind of questions the branch of mathematics that deals with answering these kind of questions it is called as calculus and of course it internally has two components or subdivisions called as derivative and integration so derivative deals with calculating the in-flight properties of the ball, like the position of the ball, the velocity of the ball, and things like that. And integration deals with the aspects like the area swept by the ball throughout its path and stuff like that. And for all the maths geeks out there watching this video, you just want to make it very simple and keep it as less technical as possible for obvious reasons. Everybody should be able to understand, right? And that way it's a very dry subject like calculus. You know what it means. So the definition of calculus getting into slightly technical terms because it's necessary. There are two parts, differential calculus, which focuses on calculating the rates of change of velocities and positions. So that is one half of calculus. The other half of calculus is integral calculus, which focuses on calculating the magnitudes like lengths, areas and volumes, etc. So these two put together forms the subject calculus. So just like the example of the cricket ball, how calculus helps to calculate different aspects of the ball during its flight and all. Same way, to understand a planet that is revolving around sun, its properties, 
its position, its velocity, just like how we are trying to understand different properties of a cricket ball. Same way to understand different properties of a revolving planet. The science is exactly the same. Calculus is the branch of mathematics which helps us to determine these planetary positions. And it is because of the Jyotisha Shastra, one of the branch of Vedas, where calculus has organically evolved in Bharat. Not just calculus, in fact, trigonometry and geometry also has their organic roots right from Jyotisha Shastra. And talking of calculus, the contributions that came from Bharat are just incredible. Let's see what they are. Madhava, a 14th century astronomer from Kerala, from a region called Sangamagrama. Madhava was a follower of the Aryabhatan system of mathematics and astronomy. And Madhava established the Kerala school of astronomy and mathematics back in the 14th century. It's almost 700 years ago from now. Madhava of Sangama Grama is well popular in the academic circles for his incredible inventions in the fields of calculus. Madhava is the founder of the Kerala School of Astronomy and his students Parameshwara, Nilakanta, Jyestadeva and many more. And each of them individually authored various ancient scriptures like Tantra Sangraha, Yukti Bhasha and Karana Paddhati and lot many other scriptures which has groundbreaking inventions in the fields of calculus and mathematics. Now let's try to understand what are the contents of the scriptures. Tantra Sangraham, written in 151 CE. It translates to a compendium of techniques. That's what Tantra Sangraham means. And what you are seeing here is a palm leaf manuscript, the original one of Tantra Sangraham, composed in Samskritam and written using Malayalam script. And on the cover of this palm leaf manuscript, in the box highlighted here, you read the name Vish. It is the name of an Englishman who collected these manuscripts 200 years ago. That's in the early 1800s. Remember his name, Vish. C. M. Vish or Charles Matthew Vish. It is the same name that appeared on the cover of the palm leaf manuscript. He's the one who collected all those manuscripts. Was the English civil servant in the Madras establishment of the East India Company. Wish was the first one to bring to the notice to the Western mathematical scholarship the achievements of the Kerala School of Astronomy and Mathematics. And in fact, he wrote a white paper. What you're seeing now on the screen is a white paper written by C. M. Wish in a journal back in 1835 explaining the technicalities of the Kerala School of Astronomy. And try to pause this video and read the full title of the white paper. This is how it reads. On the Hindu quadrature of the circle and the infinite series of the proportions of the circumference to the diameter exhibited in the four Shastras. He's talking about four Shastras. Tantra Sangraham, Yukti Bhasha, Karana Paddhati, Sadratna Mala by Charles M. Vish. So it's basically a complete quick tour of all the four important scriptures that came out of Kerala School of Astronomy. Now, what are the contents of this white paper? We'll just see that. I will post the link to this journal in the description below. This white paper is the first recorded evidence about the ancient Indian calculus that moved towards westwards. And in this white paper, Mr. Vish explains about the contents of the Tantra Sangraham the palm leaf manuscript that he collected and many more of them. So what is in Tantra Sangraham, the manuscript that we just saw a minute ago? So it is a compendium of 432 verses spread across eight chapters dealing about the following things. Madhya Prakaranam, mean longitudes of planets, calculating the different longitudes of the different planets. As you heard it right, it is not the longitudes of the earth alone, but the longitudes of the planets like Jupiter, Mars, Mercury, etc. Getting into finer calculations of the longitudes and then Chaya Prakaranam, mnemonic shadow calculations, calculations of the lunar eclipse and solar eclipse, the relative positions of sun and moon, possible errors and corrections, earth and moon positions. So it's a long list. So all these eight chapters put together, this 432 verses are collections of the mathematical concepts, formulas as to how we can calculate different astronomical events or properties of different celestial bodies. Long story short, Tantra Sangraham is a book of all the mathematical details that has to deal with rate of change and time computation, the very founding pillars for calculus. Let's try to understand the contents of the white paper written by Mr. Vish on these four Shastras, Tantra Sangraham, Yukti Bhasha, Karana Paddhati and Sadratna Mala. So let's pick up with a very interesting slokam that he translated in his white paper. 
it is for calculating the value of pi. If you want, you can pause it and read in English or we'll proceed for the narration. As you might know, the pi is a transcendental number besides being irrational. That means it just never ends. After the decimal, it just goes on till infinity. And having the accurate value of pi is of great importance when we are dealing with astronomical calculations. And to achieve this precession, Madhava, back in the 1300s to 1400s period, he gave a slokam to calculate the value of pi. Let's try to understand what it is. Vyase varadi nihate rupahate vyasa sagara bihate trisharadi vishaya sankhya bhaktam pradam svam pradhat kramat kuriyat and the translation is the circumference of a circle is equal to the diameter with a product of an alternating series of 1 minus 1 by 3 plus 1 by 5 minus 1 by 7 and so on. If you want to read the literal word to word translation, it was just present in the previous scene where I extracted the snapshot from the white paper. And when we simplify the circumference and diameter and represent in the terms of pi, this is what we have. Pi is equal to 4 multiplied by 1 minus 1 by 3 plus 1 by 5 minus 1 by 7, so on till infinity. So longer the terms in your series, better the precession of pi that you get. And this is the first time in the whole world that the pi is so very generalized because before this, the civilizations were adding one digit after other for pi. But Madhava gave a groundbreaking innovation to identify the value of pi to the highest precession possible as per your need. And not just that, Expressing a finite quantity like pi in an infinite series to gain precession is the foundational thought for calculus. Integration by parts. And of course, in the academic circles, this series given by Madhava is named after his name called as the Madhava series. Unfortunately, a vast majority of us don't know what are the great contributions that came from Bharat in the field of calculus. Anyways, a lot more to see. Let's proceed. Like this, Mr. Wish translates many Samskritam slokams from Tantra Sangraha, Sadratnamala, Yukti Bhasha and Karana Paddhati, the ancient scriptures that were written by the Kerala School of Astronomy in his white paper. Here one point what I would like to highlight is, we are used to mathematics with numbers and symbols which is printed in our textbooks and all that way of working. But back in ancient India, it was purely the only language that is used is in Samskritam. Doesn't matter which script that you use, the mathematical details are codified in the slokas that you are seeing here highlighted in the red dots and that's how Mr. Wish translated with the help of the locals over there back then to understand these mathematical advancements of those times. Now this is the most interesting part towards the end of the white paper this is what Mr. Wish has written. Let me read word to word. This is what he says. Having thus submitted to the inspection of the curious eight different infinite series extracted from Brahmanical works of the quadrature of the circle it will be proper to explain by what steps the Hindu mathematicians have been led to these forms. So basically he is talking about the infinite series expressions that he came across all these scriptures. And observe the quotes where I highlighted in the red line. Mr. Wish says that these have only been the infinite series what he explained in this white paper in 1835 have only been made known to Europeans through the method of fluxions. Fluxions are a technical component of the calculus as a subject. So the fluxions are the inventions of the illustrious Newton. And then he says, let us first, however, know the age of these works. That means how old are these, the Tantra Sangraha and the rest, all four scriptures. First then, it is a fact which I have ascertained beyond doubt. I read it again. He says that he ascertains beyond doubt that this invention of the infinite series of the forms have originated in Malabar. The most important aspect, he ascertains after detailed examination of all the scriptures that it has organically evolved in the coast of Malabar, meaning the Kerala School of Astronomy and Mathematics. So reading Mr. Wish's words again, he says that he ascertains it beyond doubt that all these infinite series and the calculus as a whole in these ancient scriptures have originated in Malabar beyond any doubt. And towards the end of this paragraph and also at the end of the white paper, this is what he says. Again, I highlighted towards the bottom in red. 
with the fluxional forms fluxional again i said it's part of the calculus it's a technical component of the calculus subject these fluxional forms and series to be found in no work of foreign or other indian countries so what it means is this concepts that were developed in kerala school of astronomy were not known to the outside world and also to the other parts of india it is just originated and confined only to the kerala region and the most important observation that you should be making here is the chronology of the events madhava was 300 years before newton and the scripture that we are talking about tantra sangraha was written in 1501 that is almost 200 years before newton invented calculus this is not some sort of nationalist propaganda and all that kind of nonsense this is just plain facts the recorded history that we are talking about now here are the key contributions from the Kerala School of Astronomy with their names in the modern terminology of the mathematical concepts and the inventors. Towards the left are the Indian inventors and towards the right are the European or the Western inventors of the same concept. And do observe the chronology or the dates. So the Newton Gauss interpolation, Govinda Swami in 800 CE and invented again by Newton and Gauss in 1750 CE. Next comes Newton power series for sine and cosine, Madhava in 13th century, Newton in 17th century, Taylor series for sine and cosine functions, again Madhava in 13th, 14th centuries, and Brooke Taylor in 16th, 17th centuries. And then Tycho Brahe's reduction to ecliptic, Achyuta in 15th and 16th centuries, and Tycho Brahe around the same period. And then comes L. Euler's formula for circumradius of cyclic quadrilaterals. Parameshwara in 1300s to 1400s and Jean Alhaeuler in 1700s to 1800s. And then comes Leibniz series for inverse tangent, Madhava 1350 to 1420, Leibniz 1646 to 1716. And then comes Leibniz power series for pi, Nilakanta in 1444 to 1544, Leibniz 1646 to 1716. Approximations of the value of pi, that's what we just saw, Madhava in 1350 to 1420. Newton in 1643 to 1727. Now let me put one thing very clearly. My intention of giving all the chronology and all the contributions and mapping them against is no way to disrespect anybody towards the right side, the intellectuals from Europe. Absolutely not, not at all. It is just to bring forward the fact that many of these mathematical contributions related to calculus and by large other fields of mathematics as well Kerala School of Astronomy has incredible contributions and these scriptures could have potentially been translated into other languages and traveled westwards, we don't know. But what is more important than that is to highlight the fact that these contributions that came from Kerala has to be well known to the world especially to the people of Bharat, which is not the case now. So our objective in making this documentary film is to highlight all the contributions that came from Kerala in context of calculus and mathematics, because this is real history. And if this subject is of interest to you, I'll be more happy if you don't believe in my words, but read for yourself these ancient scriptures, which holds these mathematical concepts that were first invented in Bharat in the history of mathematics. Surya Siddhanta, Arya Bhattiya, Brahma Sputa Siddhanta, Siddhanta Shiromani, Tantra Sangraham, Yukti Bhasha. The ancient scriptures on mathematics that came out of Bharat are just incredible and unbelievable. The contributions and the rich mathematical and scientific heritage of Bharat is just amazing. So that's a brief outlook on Kerala's contributions in the fields of calculus and astronomy. The chapter number two ends there. And let's get to the third and last chapter. Possible transmission of knowledge from Kerala to Europe. Was there any transmission of this knowledge to Europe? Let's try and understand that. Concerning this knowledge transmission in or out of any civilization, let's take three different scenarios and you'll get to know what I mean. Let's take the first scenario where the knowledge goes out of India and rebranded as if it is a local invention. We are talking about Pingala, an ancient Sanskrit scholar back in 200 BC. He was the actual inventor of this concept of what we know today as Pascal's triangle. He termed it as Meru Prasthara, and that is the original invention as part of Sanskritam grammar. 
and what you are seeing here in the red box is a manuscript dated to 700 AD that is 1300 years ago. It is a technique used by the Samskritam grammarians. Now this concept, this mathematical concept was translated by Yang Hui, a Chinese mathematician in 13th century, Omar Khayyum, a Persian mathematician in 11th century and then Niccolo Tattaglia from Italy in 16th century and finally by Blaise Pascal from France in 16th century. The whole world knows this before even Pascal was born but today it is called as Pascal's Triangle because that's how the history of science was written and people just follow it. But the roots of the where this knowledge has originated is in Bharat. This is just one scenario. Okay, hold on for the other scenarios. The second scenario is knowledge develops parallelly and independently. Take zero for instance. We all know that it's a concept employed by the ancient Indian mathematicians. But this concept of zero is not native only to Bharat because Mayan civilization and few other civilizations also had this concept of zero in their number system. So this is a case where the knowledge develops independently and parallelly. What's highlighted here in the white circles towards the left is the zero, the notation for zero as per the Mayan number system. And towards the right is the oldest written record of zero in Bharat. That's from the Bhakshali manuscript referred with a dot. So moral of the story is, yes, concepts can be developed independently and in parallel. And the third scenario is knowledge arrives from outside to India. That means we learn from the other countries around the world. And a classic example for this one is Pancha Siddhantika written by Varaha Mihira in 450 to 500 AD. It's almost 1500 years ago. And in Pancha Siddhantika, he writes it as five books. Surya Siddhanta, Vasista Siddhanta, Paulasya Siddhanta, Romaka Siddhanta and Paitamaha Siddhanta. In these, if you see the three and four, Paulasya Siddhanta is nothing but the Greek astronomy. And the fourth one, Romaka Siddhanta is the Roman astronomy. Varaha Mihira back then articulated how the Greeks and the Romans used to calculate their astronomical observations in this book Pancha Siddhantika where the knowledge has arrived from outside to India. Now the reason I'm quoting these scenarios is firstly to understand the facts you have to put aside your political religious or regional biases. Second for us to understand whether calculus got transmitted from Bharat towards Europe or not, we need to examine from scenario 1 and scenario 2 point of view, where either it got developed parallelly in Europe and Bharat as well, or it got transmitted from Bharat to Europe. Scenario 3 is irrelevant for us. So let's try and understand from these angles. Let us try to go with a simple timeline of the major events that happened in Europe and India in parallel. This period from 1300s to 1800s, this 500 years period is very important because this is when calculus was born both in India as well as in Europe. Now let's try to plot the major events that happened in these two parts of the world. First, to start with the Indian side, 1193 to 1206, Bhaktiar Kilji destroys Nalanda and other universities. This was the downfall or the start of the downfall of the great Indian education system. A very important milestone that hit India very badly. About the same period in 1202 CE, the Hindu numeral system was first introduced to Europe by Leonardo Pisano in his book Liberabaki. And this was the start of the adoption of Hindu number system across Europe. And this has fundamentally changed the way Europe operated with mathematics. Till then Europe was using Roman numerals for trade and commerce and other mathematical calculations. But then they shifted to the Hindu numeral system in 1200 CE, which is a very important turning point in the field of mathematics mathematics in Europe. And then in the year 1350, Madhava of Sangamagrama, he was born and so with him is the Indian calculus. And his lifetime was 1350 to 1420 CE. This is the start point for the birth of Indian calculus. And very unfortunately, at the same time in Europe, the Black Death pandemic, the bubonic plague, it clouds the entire Europe. It is many times more deadly than the COVID-19 pandemic that we are going through now. In the year 1450, Nilakanta Somayaji, student of the Kerala School of Astronomy and also the student of Madhava, he writes the Tantra Sangraha that we just saw in 1501. And in 1498, Vasco da Gama sets his foot on the shore of Calicut in Kerala. And this is the start of the eventual colonization of Bharat. Another great mathematician from the Kerala School of Astronomy, Jyestadeva, lived between 1500 to 1610 CE. He authors Yukti Bhasha, another incredibly detailed scripture on calculus and mathematics 
from the Kerala School of Astronomy. And about the same time, in 1582, the Gregorian calendar, what we are using today, is standardized by the Vatican, replacing the Julian calendar. Then in 1638, Kepler formulates the planetary laws of motion, a very important turning point in the history of physics. And then in 1638, Galileo Galilei authors the two new sciences, founding text for the field of kinematics. And finally, in 1660 to 1700s, Newton and Leibniz invents calculus independently. So that is the complete timeline that we are interested in to understand how did or if at all calculus travel from Bharat towards the West or not. These are the events that we need to examine in conjunction with each other. One indisputable evidence that calculus was translated and transmitted eventually towards Europe through the white papers of C.M. Wish, that's what we just saw, right? Where he translated the manuscripts of Tantra Sangraha and likes of it. But by 1835, Newton already invented calculus and so did Leibniz. So the question is, yes, of course, this is definitely one evidence where the calculus got translated from Bharat to Europe. But did anything happen before Newton inventing calculus? Let's try to understand from that perspective. For that, we need to understand Jesuits. So who are Jesuits? In the medieval times, Jesuits are the priests of the Catholic Church who besides spreading the gospel, also focused on understanding and collating the scientific advancements around the world. And the Malabar region being a hotspot for the trade in the ancient world, that is the reason I covered the history of Malabar with respect to trade and commerce in ancient world in the very beginning of this documentary. It's for the same reason. Now, Malabar coast has been flogged with a lot of Jesuits during these periods. And there was immense interest and focus from Jesuits to understand the local language, the culture, including the scientific advancements of this civilization. One book shown here with the title The Jesuits in Malabar. It's a two-volume book and should be interested to learn about the Jesuit activities on the Malabar coast historically between the medieval times. This book details out all the activities of Jesuits back then on the Malabar coast, should you wish to read. And that period when Vasco da Gama entered India, and also when Jesuits were in the Malabar coast during that period, that 1500 period. That was when the Vatican was trying to standardize the Gregorian calendar what we are having today. And one challenge for them back then was the date of Easter. Because Easter, unlike Christmas, is not fixed on one single date. It always occurs on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. So it has an astronomical significance and it has to be in sync with the vernal equinox. That is the reason Easter changes every year. It will not be on the same date just like Christmas always on December 25th. Easter is not like that. If you see the dates here for the last decade, Easter keeps on moving. This is one of the important challenges that the Gregorian calendar establishment people faced back then. And this called for highly accurate astronomical calculations. And there were a lot of limitations for the Julian calendar and calculating Easter was not feasible following those practices or the framework of Julian calendar. Bottom line, there was a lot of research as to how to correct the calendar with respect to Easter. Now what I'm about to say is just my personal observation and my conjecture. If you observe the timeline and the events that are happening on the Malabar coast back then, one possibility is that in the 16th century CE, standardization of Gregorian calendar could have triggered Jesuits' interest in studying the Indian astronomy and the calculus, which is very instrumental in calculating the equinoxes, Earth's positions and other planetary positions. And this knowledge source could have got transmitted from Kerala towards Europe. And again, after analyzing multiple points together, this is just one observation of mine. There is no written evidence as such like Jesuits translated these texts back then in 1500 before Newton inventing calculus. There is no such evidence, anything of that sort. But putting all these things together, that definitely could have been a possibility. Remember the scenario one in the knowledge transfer, how Pascal's triangle was rebranded as Pascal's triangle, whereas actually known well over to the world centuries before that. Similar thing could have happened. Or another possibility is calculus organically got developed within Europe itself by Newton and Leibniz. So it's a 50-50 chance. Either it got transmitted from India to Europe or it got organically developed within Europe itself. Either of these will definitely be true. But whichever is the case, the fact of the matter undisputably and incontrovertibly is 
calculus was invented in Bharat at least 300 years before Newton and Leibniz did. Whichever scenario it could be, this fact will not change. To sum it up all, the key contributions that came in from Kerala School of Astronomy and Mathematics five to six hundred years ago from now were just incredible. And these are the facts that should be made to the history of Bharat. The students of Bharat should learn these facts to understand how Bharat has contributed to the betterment of humanity in the field of mathematics. And in this context, let me also call out certain set of people who kind of term it as pseudoscience and whatnot without knowing a thing about the historical contributions that came in from Bharat. Neither is this some sort of nationalistic propaganda and all this kind of nonsense. Because this set of people slash intellectuals, they often say that when you talk about history, don't talk about past, talk something what we can do now. They say that don't blow your trumpet, but this is not blowing a trumpet. This is called setting the record straight. Do you know the gravity of intellectual property? Few months back, when the world is dying out of COVID, there was a lot of tussle on vaccine patent waivers. Putting aside all the investments that would have happened in innovation and all that stuff, end of the day, patents are the soft and hard power of an economy or a civilization. And here we are not talking about patents and all that kind of stuff. It is just about one thing, just one simple thing, giving the credit where it rightfully belongs to. That's all. And that brings us towards the end of this doc film. I'm so happy that I could make this doc film about the untold history of Kerala and Calculus. But what makes me even more happy is if people just don't believe in these YouTube videos or WhatsApp forwards, but get to the actual scriptures and read for themselves to understand the history of calculus for its facts and truth. And as always, thanks for watching.